Welcome back to the City of Palms podcast. Me and Danny are a little bit closer than normal today. We're going to share this in mic, so bear with us. Uh, today, uh, it's going to be a pretty laid back, fun episode. We've got two people who you, you we would actually recognize one of them. We have Evan Seals. Both are sound guys. Both are musically inclined in many ways, and um, both are awesome human beings. So it's going to be cool to That's sit right. down and chat with you all today. Uh, and Cody Smith is a face that y'all have not seen before. He will probably get his own episode one day. I'm sure he's just going to be affiliated with us for a while and whatnot. Um, how are you guys doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm really excited to be here. I've uh, missed you guys a lot. And uh, this new setup is fucking wonderful. And I'm really proud of you guys. Can I say bad words? You can say whatever you want. Okay. I always I have to ask at the beginning. I, I For some reason, I never do before it starts. And I always do afterwards. And I always promise myself that I'm not going to. But at least now I'm being vocal about it. And that makes me feel good at <laughs> How are you, Cody? Uh, past two months sucked. Today sucked, but this right here is the fucking highlight of everything yeah. going on. Yeah, right now. that's what it's all about. We all have, you know, we, 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 this stuff's hard. All right. <laughs> yeah. This daily life thing is pretty hard. Everything. But we got to look forward to these moments. Everything's different, man. <laughs> and it's kind of strange. It's, I got to say, it's kind of strange that this happened the way it did because the entire past few weeks we've had a guest scheduled for today and then just yesterday it fell through and i just messaged evan right after it fell through and was like hey you're in town from uh you're in in florida for a week Mm -hmm. you could could you come for a podcast and he's like heck yeah and i said last night i saw cody and i said hey we're having evan over for a podcast would you want to come too he's like yes in fact i would so now we're all here nothing's a coincidence people we are supposed to be here yeah and uh on that note these shirts are available now we don't have a shop open but you can dm us on instagram or facebook or youtube YouTube or anywhere that we have content and make sure you subscribe because if we oh, if we pass a thousand subscribers i am giving danny a tattoo oh, shit. That's and cool. i've never operated a tattoo machine before so this will be pretty interesting it's fun <laughs> it's fun that's i got a fucking sketch i love it yeah i got i got a homemade tattoo on the back of my leg it's a cat face that's like a centimeter across that i let one of my girlfriends do on me <laughs> not one of my smartest choices but it happened <laughs> have you ever given somebody a tattoo yeah Oh, word. Yeah, it was the same thing. Word. Which was pretty sweet. I mean, it turned out better than I thought it would. Not something I'm turning into a career. Right. It's not happening. Yeah, I, I got faith in him. I got faith in Brian. Yeah, yeah okay. I can't do anything that couldn't be considered abstract art. So I'm working on it. <laughs> At least visually. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> so uh, what's been going on with you, man? What's What are your woes about? Tell me about your life. So it's good to see you, by the way. You too, man. I haven't seen you since I was naked at Josh's party. Good times. Yeah, good times. A lot of those people are doing really good now. A lot of those people are doing horrifically bad now too. Yeah, Yeah, it makes me feel good about where we're at in life right now. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not like, (laughs) I'm not actually bad. I'm just a petulant child who has spent so much of his life just being able to do whatever the fuck I want, and Mm -hmm. now I'm working retail again. For, like, the first time in five years. So, like, I've spent nothing but growth since 2015. Just up, slumming it, getting shitty gigs, growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, it was like, no, you have to go work at at Target now. I feel like retail is, like, the great equalizer of the soul, man. I feel like that's, like, the ultimate grounding. I feel like it's, like, the the employment equivalent of rehab. (laughs) Yes. Where it's, like... (laughs) I gotta go to Florida and work at Target for a few months, man. I'll come back better than I was before, bro. I promise that'll be seventy two ninety five. Do you want brown hangers or teal ones? <laughs> and it gets to, it gets to the point where once, like, as a creative individual, as you work retail, you're kind of like, like at least from my experience, you kind of just get stuck in it until mm-hmm. you start to realize like there's other things that I could be doing to make a living. And then once you do get out of it, like I haven't got out of it yet, but so yeah. like Chris Topher, yeah. my roommate, he got out of it. He's been him. a professional musician Please for years. Please tell him I say hi. I love that man so much. Is he might, is he here right now? Or is he, I think he's here. Uh, he might come out. I'm but a- anyways, a um, he's right there. Hey, Hello, Chris oh, Topher. What's up, dude? But he Good made it. You, he made it out. He didn't have to do the corporate yeah. America anymore, and he's a professional yeah. musician. And then going back in because of COVID, you know, we all got to pay bills. Going back in, it's even more soul crushing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, so I feel for you, Cody. I'm sorry you have to deal with this, but you'll get through it. Temporary. I feel temporary. like that time of like I want to say isolate. It's not isolation because you're surrounded by people, but mm-hmm. like the time you get with yourself, just in your head when you're working retail, yeah. is some of the most powerful time I've ever had with myself. I remember like the last time I worked at Panera Bread when I'd be like s- somehow got the 
pulled the bitch straw of being in the dish pit that night. Just like the life planning I did while in that dish pit and like the future visualizing was like yeah. one of the things that set me up for success. So I try and have that mentality when I'm there and not just think about yeah. like playing in traffic while I'm, you know, there. <laughs> but it's okay. It happens. It's not, not always a bad experience because I've met really cool people doing retail and stuff like that too. Yeah. So I, I, I don't always think of it as like a rock bottom situation it's just like another step you got to step on up from man and don't get caught up in middle management dude <laughs> oh, no, fuck, that. fuck that management career path being yeah. like 17 fucking years in at target still making 15 goddamn hour, dollars an hour oh, no. corporate management ruins people dude i've seen people who are beautiful bright rainbow right brained individuals with an entire future ahead of them and like one retreat to a management seminar at the Hyatt and they're a changed person. It's like retail boot camp, yeah. dude. Mm -hmm. It ruins these people and like, dude, you gotta work hard enough to have a red shirt at the retreat because if you're a blue shirt, you mean fucking nothing, bro. Like, this, these are the, the, uh, the uh, setups that they do in these kinds of things and it's weird because like at one point it's team building but at this point it's everything you do you're just a cog in the machine and you do it for the betterment of the team here's a bunch of walmart branded shit thank you for coming to our team building retreat now we're gonna go do a yurt circle are you excited for that uh-uh i'm fucking not so like i praise you guys for like working you know yeah. you're not like living an icp song and working for yourself scratching your nuts like you're doing something like that's fine just because you don't have gigs doesn't mean you can't find work, you know? I know a lot of motherfuckers who are like, I can't run sound anymore, bro. What do you want me to do? I don't know, bro. Go groom dogs. Go do anything. Yeah. Go find something new and exciting to fucking to, to, to do, you know? You don't have to, uh, you don't have to sell printers, man. <laughs> or you can sell printers if yeah. you want to, dude. I know hella people who are happy at Best Buy, dude. Just do something that makes you happy, and if you don't like it, change, you know? Or, like, at least find something sweet until you can find something sweeter. Or, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, like, complacency is okay sometimes as long as it gives you breathing room to find what's next. But, like, personally, when I find myself in a routine that I can't get out of, I find that more claustrophobic than being in, like, a crate somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. I can't handle that personally, yeah. but, like, mm -hmm. I'm... 280 HD, dude. I do something once and it's science and it's exciting. I do something again and it's, it's engineering. I'm perfecting it. And then after that, I'm just a technician and want to do something else or jump out of a window. <laughs> Were you a fucking shaman in a past life or some shit? I'm, this is like fucking spiritual, man. I don't know, man. I've just fucked up so many times doing all of this. It's like forced me to find what I love to do through just trudging through the bullshit of everything I didn't want to do. Or I've had like a lot of Trojan horses where I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And then I'm halfway through it and I'm like, oh my God, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, except it's made out of more bullshit, except it's on fucking fire. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know, man. It just depends. I, I've just done so many jobs I hated. And I've also done so many do jobs I loved that I just ended up hating, too. Like, that's one of my favorite things about being in North Carolina is, like, I'm not tethered to doing IT work anymore, you know? Like, retainer money's cool, but, like, I don't have people who, you know, own plastic surgery offices screaming to me about their websites anymore i just gave that shit to other people and i'm just happy not that i don't love them or those businesses but just like it's stagnant man and yeah. like what's the least favorite job that you had oh man Especially, like, as far as sound work goes. Like, what's the Oh, least as far as sound work goes? Yeah, yeah you, we being, don't have to get too deep into jobs. If but. we're being... Oh, dude, I was going to say, I worked overnight at a gas station for a year and a half, and that's something everybody needs to do in their life, bro. <laughs> All right, everyone needs to do... I've learned so much about myself. <laughs> but as far as sound goes, um, I ran sound for a Kenny G concert one time uh -huh. when I was 18. Fuck. Because I used to work with the uh, audiovisual company at the Hyatt and Kenny G, the, the jazz guy, the flute player. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Saxophone. He, uh, uh, he does. He, he he's a windy guy. You know, he does wind things. <laughs> he also does awkward things, because like he made us tape the Golf Channel on VHS. <laughs> I and, love it, dude. We had to deliver it to him up to his hotel room. And I was like, we need to do what? And he's like, we got to take this tape up to Kenny, dude. Because I'm already like, are, are we really working for Kenny fucking G? He's like, yeah, look at all the fake palm trees in the ballroom, my guy. We're doing this. <laughs> 
because yep. there's financial companies that come in. You know, they hire musicians to do shows for them, and it's mm-hmm. uh, pretty cool. But uh, we get up to his hotel room, and this man is in, like, cabana shorts or underwear or somewhere in between the two. I don't know. He was wearing, like, a straw hat, and he was really, really excited to see us. And we give him his tape, and he's just like, what are you guys doing right now? And I was just like, we're just, like, downstairs setting up your show, man. And he's like, you guys want to, like, come in for a cocktail? And I was like, what the fuck? And you know, I was just like, I'm not, I'm not even old enough to drink, dude. And like my dude that I was with, it's like, yeah, we're like setting up your show, man. And he's like, not even for like a minute. And like, this was like the first time I experienced like, because like I always thought being a famous musician was, you know, hanging out with people all the time, being at bars, doing press, doing all of that wild shit. I never once can, I guess thought about how lonely it is just sitting in a hotel room for months on end and not having anyone to talk to and like i was too young to process that at the time and it made me so sad afterwards so i worked the whole show and he was a dick to all the monitor engineers and shit and like he just like then we weren't allowed to talk to him halfway through the show and it was super fucking weird and awkward and it just made me really sad it made me really sad and uh other than that, the only bad experiences I've had doing audio are just bands who think they're famous before they are. Uh, I don't know how to put it, dude. There's just so many local bands around here that treat their one-off engineers like shit, and then they never go back to them again because they treat them like shit. Like, there's, mm-hmm. this town is only so big, you know? The people, not, not that the people who are here aren't incredibly talented, but a lot of the people who have a bigger vision for themselves have relocated themselves in a lot of ways because... I know the people that I know that have moved out are like, dude, I, I, you know, there's only like 20 or 30 people to work with, you know, and once they all burn their bridges with you, where the mm-hmm. hell do you go from there? Exactly. And it sucks because none of these people are self-aware enough to see how they're keeping themselves stuck. And when you see them repeating the same mistakes over and over again, it's just saddening because you know how amazing these people are and how much better they could be doing. But I mean, that's on them to discover themselves. I can't think I'm good enough or it's my job to tell them how to do their job. I can just see the mistakes they're making and hope they don't repeat them so yeah it sucks i've seen that happen too with like friends and former friends and it's it's yeah it sucks yeah i mean but like also there's a certain level where you have to separate your friendship from your professionality and if as long as you can maintain that balance that's very very important because there's definitely been shows where i'm like listen i love you a lot and we're going to be friends till the end but if this ever happens again i'm going to set your house on fire and it happens, and it's okay. No one's ever actually set anyone's houses on fire. We've only wanted to. At the end of the day, once you go through a bunch of experiences where you're like, hey, man, I'm never going to make that mistake again, and neither are you. You do that like 500 times, and all of a sudden, you're a fucking expert. <laughs> so uh, it's nice. It's cool. I fuck up a lot all the time. All right? I'm not sitting here saying that I'm not an idiot a lot. And I, t- and try, and I try to explain that to everybody back home, too. They're like... I feel like a lot of people project a lot of smart onto me. And I'm just like, you motherfuckers are going to learn one day, bro. I swear to fucking God you are. But so far, everything's fine. And I haven't burned down our house in North Carolina yet. So <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So how is North Carolina? You went out there? What, what, what are you doing out there? Uh, I made a company with all of the people I've ever done the most successful things in my entire life with. Nice. We're, we, we are, we're a think tank that disguises itself as an entertainment company. Like, it's cool. We have all the facilities. You know, we got a recording studio. We got, like, a film studio. We have everything we need to do that because we're, as far as production goes, we're focusing on, you know, audio recording, engineering, sound design. I want to do composition for indie films and commercials and, you know, video games and shit like that because, like, I make too much weird shit that no one can do anything with, you know? So, like, if I can put it to a donkey riding into the sunset maybe somebody can get something out of it you know (laughs) but i'm trying to focus on more than just the production aspect of it one of the things we're focusing on is copyrights so if there is an artist where you know you've been recording for a few years and you want to figure out how to get your music out to your friends or if you're really trying to like hit it super hard and really trying to get 100 percent into it you know they Someone gives us a flat fee and we do their copyrights for them as well as distributing their music onto all platforms, you know, Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, all of that stuff. Because 
there's a learning curve that not a lot of people want to deal with when it comes to that, you know? And we're telling people like, listen, you have the option to go do this yourself. This is something that any person could sit on their computer and do for themselves. All we're doing is applying a platform where you can focus on your music in your day to day, because there's lots of people who have lots of money. They just don't have time to deal with it. Or mm -hmm. yeah. there's older people who don't know what the fuck ASCAP or BMI is or how any of that works, you know? So they let us just deal with it. And it's really, really cool. But that's just one thing, you know, that's not even the main focus of the business because there's so many people underneath us that are so talented. We are almost like a, a consignment program for everybody within our business. So like our client presents us a problem and we figure out a way between us to figure out a solution for what they need. At the end of the day, that's how we work. Nice, dude. Yeah. So, so and I think what you said at first I mean, all of it's important, but I like what you said at first with the uh, the think tank. No, well, yeah, but um, how you how you were saying that you know you're getting people on and you're worrying about the more business side of it, so they can focus on their music. I think that's yeah. important because a lot of like, oftentimes I'll see someone really talented, but mm -hmm. like you know they might not understand starting out that it takes time. You know, it takes oh, time yeah. to do this. And oh, yeah. if they're not seeing results right away, they're going to get tired out. But it's so much more beneficial to them if they can do what they're doing, have someone like you guys well, cover all that. I think one of the biggest problems is these people release music with unrealistic expectations. And they think if yeah. they just dump their music onto a streaming site, there's going to be an audience for them. Yeah. And it doesn't really work that way. You know, you have to do soft launches you have to release video content that hints at what you're doing or you know something inventive you know you just sure. you can't just f fall on deaf ears and expect results you know yeah, yeah. branding and networking is it's important. super hard but like yeah. you know people f focus all their energy on just getting good at their craft and not how to build the house it sleeps in you know mm -hmm. fucking yeah. at me next time man <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say i was gonna say cody you're someone who you've done sound work uh, like all around town you you have the capabilities and you and you do do everything yourself you know like you yeah. you have cody and co cody ampersand co for anyone who wants to look it up <laughs> mm -hmm. you have your own musical projects but you're also you have the know how to help everyone else you know like you said yeah. last night off air you were saying at ollie's at the open mic you were recording in the back you know mm -hmm. and i wonder from your perspective how that is as an artist because we're we've talked to people about the going the signed route or doing the independent thing because nowadays both are mm -hmm. very very possible you know mm -hmm. and i wonder from your perspective as an artist how it is trying to be an artist and create music and write songs and like and things like and play instruments while also dealing with all of that back end stuff it, it's a job like that's the point though like music is a job engineering is a job and like it's a job that i fucking love and i feel like Evan it's does a too. labor of love for sure yeah but like i love every hair that i pull out while doing it yeah <laughs> and so like when i'm knocking out an ep like i'm sitting down fucking eight hours a, a day writing recording demoing touching stuff back up overdubs all that stuff and when i'm over at a sound engineering gig that's closer to a 12 hour day but from start to end that's my job and it's a job that i get to get paid in whiskey and too much money to do but yeah it's still a job yeah. and you have to treat it like that there's a lot of people that like to treat music as like a get rich quick scheme and i that's the whole reason i started cody and co was dealing with all these fuckers that were like wanting to start a band and i used to be a drummer so Everybody wanted to have me in their band, and then they were like, oh, we're going to do this fucking single, we're going to do this show, we're going to get so big, we're going to move to fucking Ocala and open for oh, why a day to remember. Oh, <laughs> if you move to Ocala, you already have way bigger problems than you can handle without therapy. Uh. Oh, man. Um, that is so funny. God damn it. Oh, man, that just threw me off so hard. I love you so much. I want to touch back on what you were saying with the uh, the record label versus no record label route because I feel like that's something that a lot of inexperienced bands and musicians don't even have enough know-how to really figure out which road to take because the information that they're given every day is misleading. And it's like that on purpose, you know, because these companies like TuneCore and CD Baby want you to just be like, listen, you don't know shit. You're going to give us your fucking money and then we're going to do it for you. I'm trying to have the opposite approach of that because it's really intimidating when people do that. And there's nothing wrong with signing to a record label. 
there's nothing wrong with being independent either. It depends on how you sh- how you're structured before you get on the bus to your future. If you already have functioning revenue streams in your band that are already proven, that are already self-managed, no record company is going to want to give you a big advance and do all of that because you're just going to you're just going to whiff it, you know. If you're an independent band and you already have, you know, your streams coming in and everything's good, most people are just going to want to distribute you, you know. Like all record deals are just big cash advances, you know. Yeah. All they're doing is like, here's here's a million dollars. You're going to make all your media and you also have to pay all of this money back. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you're going to make five yeah. albums. But if those five albums don't make this money back, you're not signing to anyone else forever. And you're going to have to make another project in a different name. And most people don't know that until it's way too late. And that's really fucking terrifying. Yeah, I'm trying to provide an avenue where I can help independent artists remain independent. Because once they use our services or anything we do, they're not tied to us in any way. And if anything, we give them management and artist prolification services without being a manager or being tied into us, you know, because that's intimidating for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone sits in a room talking about their future and people are already throwing around numbers 5, 10, 15, 20%, that scares the fuck out of people, you know, because especially when they're throwing around numbers with five figures at a time and all of that, we want to make people being comfortable being independent. And we want them to know what that looks like. And we want them to know what it looks like when someone's trying to take advantage of them as well. Because the more money and time that we save them initially by them using us, it's going to not only inspire them to be more of an artist afterwards, but like it's like a, it's like a better version of a revolving door. It just spins the other way and allows them to spend more money on our services and what we do to better themselves instead of indenturing themselves to us which most record labels seem to do i mean there's going to be artists that we believe in that we're going to be like you don't have any money we're going to we're going to give you an advance on services that they can pay us back eventually Mm -hmm. but that's like fucking boardroom shit you know yeah but i don't know speaking of the way different ways that artists can get fucked over do you want to explain what a 60 40 is and why it's the goddamn devil um, uh, we can talk about 360 deals oh, too. Yeah, yeah, fuck. hell yeah, dude. That's my favorite one ever, dude. As soon as Fee started, we had like three of those in our inbox immediately, bro. Because you know these record labels take people who don't know themselves or what they do, and they're like, "Listen, we're gonna give you all of your revenue streams. We're gonna print all of your merch. We're gonna buy you transport. You can get whatever van you want, baby girl. Anything you want, the Mercedes. Mwah, get that fucking Mercedes because <laughs> you're paying it back with interest." Wow. And, Is that uh, what a 360 deal means? What, I don't know. Well, the, yeah. So that way they take 50% of everything from then on, you know, because that's all a record deal is. It's just like it's 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 in ensuring that the record company has income from you. And when you mm-hmm. already have guaranteed in- income streams, it makes them more intimidated by you because there's nothing that they can take from you or control. Mm-hmm. So that's why most record deals just turn into distribution deals, which are you know, uh, completely obsolete anyways because most people can self-publish and self-promote. So as long as you know how to do that and it's functional and your engine's already kicking, you're going to be good to go. But, you know, when people don't have those, that's when they get they get siren songed by them, you know, because for like sure, for sure. any $50,000 check looks sexy as fuck when it's mm-hmm. in front of you, okay? Oh, yeah. oh, but yeah. people have no idea what they're getting themselves into yeah. and people don't realize that it's better to have a slow boil up than just have one big song that's fucking yeah. everywhere that's not popular because people like the song. It's popular because people won't shut the fuck up and it's playing everywhere and people have no choice but to listen to it. And people think that that's the fame that they're supposed to be chasing when in reality that should be the opposite. Mm-hmm. You should yeah. put out an album or two and have a few organic, you know, few thousand people like your shit. So that way the people who actually like your music like you for you and you're not pigeonholed into sounding exactly yeah. how you sounded last summer when you made that one song with yeah. that one guy with that weird synthesizer you don't even have anymore. <laughs> so, and yeah. that's how you build a career, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and you're yeah. gonna fuck up doing that like eight times too. So like people try once with one project and it fails and then they, you know, fall down and don't know what to do afterwards when they don't realize that anybody who's successful has done that that many times too, you know? Mm-hmm. Which is scary, but you just have to learn to expect it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I remember a couple years back, like my friend, he's a he was a rapper and he's he's up and coming and I remember he put on his story like asking for advice. He's like, Hey, is this a good deal? 
uh, I guess he had been approached, uh, mm-hmm. twenty five thousand dollars up front, and they and the re- the people signing him own seventy five percent. And I'm like, no, dude, yeah. like no, twenty five. I don't yeah. even get you a brand new car. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. dude. But they see that check, and yeah, it's tough. We have. A weird crossover in this industry where there's people who are extremely smart and also extremely stupid maintaining the same amount of success. So you have people who are trying to take advantage of one and who are trying to snuff out the other. It's just this weird dog-eat-dog, shitty, shallow industry that people are almost forced to be terrible in sometimes. And I I don't like that aspect, dude. It's super duper weird. It's predatory. It is because mm-hmm. it's filled with a world of executives who couldn't learn how to play guitar. So they learn how to control musicians and make their careers because they could never do it themselves. For it's real. a tale as old as time, dude. And it sucks because it's uncomfortable for people to talk about because that's how it is, dude. I know a whole bunch of engineers who are fucking engineers because they could never pick up a guitar or learn how to play an instrument, you know. But, like, they love music and that's why they do it, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but yeah. other people shouldn't have to pay for it, you know. It shouldn't be like a power game, you know. And you shouldn't have to feel like you have your thumb over people in order to feel successful. But there's also... Lots of executives who did that same exact thing, who created timeless classics that all of us love. So it's like a weird balance you got to walk on and respect because it's never going to end. Yeah. And you just like have to learn how to drive the bus in a way that is respectful to yourself and the ones around you. Which is fucking scary because it's a big responsibility that other people put on you that you don't necessarily choose, you know, because once you start getting movement in this industry, everybody hangs on every single word you say and every single action you make, you know. Yeah. And to anyone listening to this, I wanted to mention, you know, because I feel like most of the people who tune in are some sort of creative, whether they're Mm -hmm. an artist or a musician or anything in between. And it's like it gets really scary and like extremely hard to manage sometimes when you know because if you get that advance like if you're an aspiring rapper per se you know and if you get that offer and you get Mm -hmm. that you know record label wanting to put you know two million dollars on your name or whatever you can then quit your job and spend everything into Mm -hmm. music you know and like and some people feel like they need that in order to make it work when as hard as it is like you you have to do anything you can like what you know if you're working a nine to five Oh yeah, you have oh, to yeah. do because I'm like I got You're never it. better than that nine to five hustle, dude. That's why I said before when you were talking about retail. If that's what you need to do to do what yeah, you need to yeah. do, then you fucking do it. You bro. pay the bills, yeah. and then and because I gotta say, like if you, I if you work a twelve hour shift at like Applebee's or something, that's grueling. You get home, all you want to do is go to sleep because mm-hmm. I was just twelve hours of some yeah. shit you did not care about, didn't want to do whatsoever. But if you mm-hmm. spend you know, eight hour, an eight hour day at such and such job. And then you spend eight hours when you get home writing or like, or even just reading, like research, you know, even mm-hmm. looking into some of these mm-hmm. things we've talked about to learn, okay, these are uh, revenue streams that I need mm-hmm. to start, you know, I need to look into passive and active income for my business mm-hmm. and like treat my art as business, yeah. you know, and really look into this stuff. B- at the end of that day, even if it was a 16 <clears throat> hour day of working, mm-hmm. I've noticed if you spend all of that time on something you enjoy, like you were just yeah. saying, if you spend a 12, 14, 16 hour day mm-hmm. just doing creative yeah. stuff, even though it's exhausting, still you go home and you sleep yeah. good because you, ju- you just Absolutely, thought like, dude. yes, Absolutely. like I'm growing, I'm building, you know, and that's what it's all about. And it's, it's hard to find things that you enjoy enough to make it not kill you at the end of the day, you know, like yeah. it. Like, but that's it, you know, like, I feel like all of us were lucky enough to find something that we can enjoy at the end of the night and enjoy passively and actively to a point where it'll make us better at doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's cool because there's so many different ways to jump into it, you know, like uh, the industry that we're in always gives us the weirdest gigs ever. And I think that's always the best backstage talk is talking about the weird shit you had to do, you know, Mm -hmm. like the last weird gig I had, I, uh, I was doing a uh, I was doing a commercial for uh, the Hyatt's travel kind of section of the hotel. So they have these uh, these uh, Segway tours. And I pretty much had to drive in circles around the people on the Segway tour with a GoPro on my head 
following these people and get really up close. And I had to get a <laughs> bunch of like lower back shots and shit. So I'm like driving hunched over with all 300 pounds of myself getting pictures just whizzing by these people's asses with my GoPros. <laughs> and like the, like the director was like, you need to be head to ass. Head to <laughs> ass. And I was like, this motherfucker takes this shit way too seriously. And I'm so happy that this is just like my Thursday and this is this guy's career because right. like... I can't imagine what fucks this guy, you know, like I can't imagine what he goes home to and what his life is like. And like sometimes your brain just goes down those spirals and you're like, damn it, I'm so glad I don't have to. I'm so glad I get to run lights at the booter tomorrow. Like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> like there's certain gigs that you get and you're like, oh my God, I'm really happy. I'm only doing this once, you know, like I did a commercial for Carnival Cruise Lines and we did a two giant Penske truck loads worth of gear onto a beach that we had to then carry a hundred foot to the right on the beach. And then we had to uh, make an office on the beach and we filmed instructional DVDs as well as welcome DVDs and a commercial for YouTube for Carnival Cruise Lines. And it was the worst fucking two days of my entire life. <laughs> okay. I watched like four people get heat stroke with the director. Like, dude, that's fine. Just bring in one of the interns anyways. We don't have to pay him. We can only give him a half day. Like these people are ruthless, bro. Ruthless. So like corporate production is wild, bro. And these people just don't care. And it's wild because like, it's cool, like, going on YouTube for a few months afterwards and seeing a Carnival Cruise Line commercial and being like, oh, shit, I made that. But also seeing how they treated people who were, you know, hired to do that was fucked up. But also that's just something that's been ingratiated into this industry is the way people treat one another because everyone's just trying to not get bitched at as much as everyone else. And everyone's climbing hands when they're climbing the hat, like the ladder when they don't realize that those same hands are the ones that are going to catch you when you fuck up and fall down. So... No one's self-aware enough to have that attitude anymore. And I'm trying to be the change that I want to see when it comes to that because this shit is shitty, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We yeah. do have to go on a break really quick. We've talked about some bigger picture career industry type stuff, but after break, I think we'll get more into local yeah. local topics. Oh, um, yeah. Enjoy the ads. In the meantime, we'll be right back for part two. Y'all. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions. How do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps people like to listen? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's what I'm doing by reading this ad. And let me tell you guys a little bit about Anchor. So, like I said, it's a one-stop shop. Distributing, you put your podcast on. It couldn't be easier to use. My brother and I, when we started this podcast, we're looking around for a website where do we get our podcast up and running how do we get it literally those exact questions how do we get it on itunes how do we get it on spotify and i was trying to do that stuff by myself and that's when i started looking up and there's podcast there's other ones you can use like jpod and all that but let me tell you anchor nobody's gonna do it as great as anchor and most of all it's free so that's that's what you always do man that's what you love is anchor being free <laughs> So if you've always wanted to start a podcast, make money doing it, go to anchor.fm slash start. That's anchor.fm slash start to join me in the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. Once again, that's anchor.fm slash start. I can't wait to hear your podcast. people working in Amazon warehouses that like had bottles they'd pee in because yeah. like, they're on a different floor and they have such an efficiency they have to keep yeah. up that they don't don't have time to go to the they bathroom. They have like a five minute break that they have to, that includes their walking to the bathroom yeah. and waiting in line That for sounds kissing. wild, bro. I've heard some horror stories of some friends who works in Amazon warehouses and it's wild. And they're right. There's like five minutes 
two times a day. You get to go use the bathroom, and then you can't be a minute early or late when you clock in for lunch because you get uh, penalized, and once you get a certain amount of points, you're just fired. It's all automated, too. There's no managers that are like, Brian, I need you to come to the office real quick. Your app just stops loading. Yeah, and that's the thing, too, is <laughs> it's, it's all like it's dude. all based on the data. So if you're not like holding up the numbers that they expect you to or think that you can, then yeah. you're not good enough. Boop. You know yeah. what I mean? When it's like they don't know what that day was like. They don't know like what. I, I don't know. I digress. 19, I talk about it way too 1984 much. looks different than we thought it would, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's why I stopped posting on Facebook. Like I just deleted it that way because all it turns into for me is just like, post dystopia we got to burn everything down every time i log in dude it is insane i don't know if you guys have any like stories or whatever about this but you know whenever like how how catered the advertisements are because yeah. because our phones are always listening to us and because yeah. like everything we ever search or type in our phone is recorded and mm-hmm. the data is stored and whatever so like the ads we're given are very specific to what we want and they thinks we need mm-hmm. and so it gets crazy to where like you have never talked to like dude there's even been times where i think i've thought it i've thought it in my head and i've never talked to anyone about it and then i'll get an ad and i'm just like like losing your hair you know that's something that like every dude thinks about like oh is my hairline receding oh is my hairline look stupider than it did last month or last year or whatever it's like what we all think about and i mean granted that's not a great example because i think most men our age do think about that so the ads just think throw it to them they're 25 24 whatever you know uh, I've seen some sketchy ones where like, you know, you talk about something and it appears there mm-hmm. or like, uh, you know, you search something on your phone. It appears on your computer. But as an engineer, I had one that freaked me the fuck out. I searched something on someone else's computer Ooh. and then it showed up on my computer. Dude, my fucking little web brain can't figure that one out at all. And I have tried all possibilities because there's just no way. There's no way. It was such a specific fucking thing, dude. That's impossible impossible yeah have you ever got text messages text message ads uh i've gotten those weird hey there's a package for you come pay us 25 dollars and get it kind of thing i got one of those that and i'm getting all of these hey i do cartoon graphics graphic design sound dungeon i have gotten so many of those since i started my business i'm gonna fucking shoot myself dude and i'll reply i'll get i got yeah. some like i used to get those too and i would reply they'd be like you need cover art you need yeah. logo designs like, you need this people. do it now and i'll be like no, I, I'm I'm a graphic designer too. And then they're like, "What are you interested? Are though? you interested?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> and then they're like, "But why?" And like, it's just it's weird. I respect dude. people for the hustle. Yeah. But like, also, you know, like they rely on the, it's 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 dick pic math, bro. If I send four thousand dick pics and only two people call the police, but one person actually calls me back, we won. We won, bro. <laughs> like we won with an honest effort. And they I don't hate send those a portfolio people, or just anything. For the record. <laughs> but what, what we were just talking about before the things were camp before we were rolling is literally mm-hmm. like as an engineer that's our job is just to keep fucking like smashing our dick against the camera until like somebody's like yeah i want that in me yeah. you just keep <laughs> recording songs over and over again until somebody's yeah. like yeah that sounds decent yeah i think i'm almost happy from the break i've had from live sound too because like it's such a love for the art man like there's nothing better than like knowing you're running on all cylinders with like 10,000 watts of sound and like a thousand people are enjoying what you do Mm -hmm. but also it's so fast for it to turn into an us versus them thing between you and the band or group you're working with sometimes and that's like its own set of nightmares dude and most of the time everything's awesome and it's cool but sometimes vocalists or band members have no fucking idea what they want and just make it really terrible and there's some of my actual worst gigs are probably come from people like that. Like when, well, one thing that a vocalist does sometimes is they'll sing really fucking quiet and then get really loud. And now you're going to have to compress that when you're editing it, you know, but I have people be like, Hey, do you have a compressor on my voice? Like, Hey, do you have a compressor on my voice? Like in the middle of a song while they're playing. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And they're like, just turn it off, bro. And I'm like, dude, you were whispering 20 seconds ago and then screamed into the microphone. I'm not doing that. And they're like, it doesn't sound good. I'm like, you can't hear yourself because your monitor is so loud. It's feeding back. And every time I turn it down to where it doesn't feed back, you're like, I need to, you don't even know what's going on right now, man. And you have to be gracious about it because I love these people and what they do. And like, it's not my fault. They don't know any better, but it's their fault that they don't want to learn any better. How do you tell your friends that their guitar tone sucks? Oof. <laughs> Oof. Because that's like with live, like, live sounds and all stuff. All right, so 
as a chunky person, I feel like I could relate to like, say if I have a friend who's also chunky and I'm like, Hey man, like, I think I'm going to start going to the gym, dude. You want to go to the gym with me? I think I want you to go to the gym with me. But instead it's like, Hey bro, let's jam. You bring over your rig. I'll bring over my rig and like, let's see what we can really do, you know? And then you just redo his tone for him and hope to God it sticks without being like, Hey man, it sounds like you're a 5150 plugged into a pork sausage, but not like a ballpark. It's like a Gwaltney hot dog that you're going to get cancer from. <laughs> so uh, it's hard, bro, because a lot of people don't know what they want. As a guitar player, I spent 10 years figuring out what I wanted my guitar to sound like. And it changes every week. Now that I've learned how to record, it just makes it fucking worse, too, bro. Because yes. yes. now I'm using like four tunings and five tones in a song. And there's just no reason for it because everything that I'm doing is telling me so hard that I should be getting back to basics and doing simple things. But now I'm like cross routing my amps and like running effects loops into the front of the amps and running it back into my interface. And <sighs> Archetype of Bossy is the coolest goddamn guitar plugin I've ever used in my life. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much cool shit to do with it, dude. Holy shit. Also, I realized that I did that entire exhausting diatribe about my business without saying its name one time. I, I was going to say, I'm I was so going to say, dumb. we should probably yeah. look at this so camera dumb. And, and mention yeah. it. At the end, we'll have proper plugs yeah. and stuff too. But uh, yeah, check out Gang Beef Entertainment on Facebook to check out everything we can do. Copywriting services, recording, engineering, freaking anything you can imagine, dude. Graphic design, film editing, anything your little media heart can desire. Or copyrights. Just get your music copyrighted and distributed so everybody can check it out. Please. Yes. I'm looking it up right now so that I don't forget. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, the, the topic I did want to get, get into at the start of part two was, mm -hmm. you know, all of us are in the local scene with art and music and everything, yeah. and we've all kind of witnessed bigger other scenes around yeah. the country and around the state and stuff like that. And sometimes I just wonder, and I bet you guys would have good input, mm -hmm. what what is the diff like what what would it take for somewhere like Southwest Florida to be something like Nashville, Tennessee, or like, or something huge to where, to where I think that's a broad arrow to short to shoot at a narrow target. I think Nashville is Nashville because Nashville is Nashville. I think if we make an environment or an arena that is unique and inspiring enough to make something like that, I think that's the only way we can do it. But we have to do that by bringing eclectic and unique individuals that allow other people from the country around us to resonate with them as well. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that by being like another place. We don't want to be Nashville. Nashville sucks. I was just <laughs> there. All right. Mm -hmm. Everybody there sucks. Everybody there drives like shit and everybody there is fucking mean. All right. It's not like the place where you can look in somebody in the eye and be like, Hey man, what's up? You walk next to a drunk dude at a bar and you look at him and you nod your head up and he's just like, Oh motherfucker. So, like, don't we don't want to be like that. We yeah. want to be like that because, like, we're, we live on the beach and life is dope. Like, we get to live the life of living where other people vacation. Like, you could call that pretentious, but there's people all over the world who are killing to be able to do what we're doing in this very moment. Mm -hmm. So, like, you should treat that as such. You know, it's special. Yeah. We want to be Southwest Florida. Yeah. Exactly. And that, also, like, there's dope-ass people coming from here all the time. Like, Dominic Fike just got signed for $4 million. All right, that motherfucker's going to take over the world. Did and you I'm hear his so new excited. album, What Capaz Liga Ron? It's so I, good. Oh my it's God. so retarded. I love it so much. He deserves everything. Okay. Like, I know we were talking shit about, like, record company advances earlier, but that motherfucker's taken care of, and he's going to yes, do sir. just fine. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to do... So good. Yeah, he I'm did so it right, proud of him, sure. dude. He's so good. And now he's got a documentary on Hulu, dog. Yeah. Like, yeah. what, bro? Did, did you watch you, that? It was yes, so good. It was so, so fucking good. good. I haven't Hell seen yeah. It yet. Yeah, it was delicious. It was incredible. Did you have input on the scenes, though? And I did. Yeah, you like, were about what, to talk, what, and they just what? smashed over you like an asshole. Nah, dude. Dude, I'm a journeyman audio engineer. Like, this mm -hmm. is my life. It's just. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was going to say, I'll talk all the shop you ever want to. Oh, absolutely. Fucking Lulu. So, like. That I've been fucking preaching since day fucking one that Southwest Florida isn't going to be fucking L.A. It's not going to be Nashville, but it's going to be on the fucking map. And I feel like if we didn't have an international fucking pandemic that had political, pol political, political, Facebook, that's why I'm off of it. Um, we were going to be on the fucking map by 2020. This was going to be the fucking grind year that every goddamn person, like not just Dominant Fike, but... Your fucking bro that's over at the goddamn Tiki Bar hosting karaoke and shit. Yeah. There's so many good musicians that have come Dude. from here, by the way. Just to, like, a short list, bro. Uh, 
Fake Problems, Traitors, Dominic Fike. Like, those, those three alone are absolutely ridiculous. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, it's, it's like it's such a wild variety, but, like, there's so many good people that have come through here. And especially, like, rappers, dude. Yeah. Like, Plies yeah. is from Fort Myers. He won't tell yeah. you in person, but he is. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize by going to open mics, like, sometimes, like, dude, last night at Ollie's, uh, shout out Ollie's, by the way. They're doing open mics again because they're back open. Woo! That's but cool. Colin, whenever Colin was playing yeah. and, and, like, he had the drums with him, too, it was like, I just look Orion? at... yeah. No, oh, no, no, no. Colin Oaks. Oh, cool. yeah. Uh, he shreds the guitar, and and uh, he just randomly had. He's a nice boy. Uh, what was the guy's name? Chris Clark. Was he the yep, drummer? Yeah, exactly that. Chris Clark from off, Offset Era, just fucking jamming on some drums. Yeah, and Colin kept looking back like, They're all awesome nice job too. on drums, because he and I look at Kyle, my roommate Kyle, and I'm just like, dude, that dude just put on a rock show at an open mic because I it was just yeah, dope, you know. And then hearing so you much. play, and like, yes, if dude. you just sit down at open mics anywhere around town, a lot of times you see these gems where it's like yeah. that person's gonna be famous, you know. Have you guys yeah. heard XMVIX? Oh, fuck. Uh-uh. Dude, the r- hip-hop group around here. Y- like, Yano, Strack, uh, Rip. I, I, they, I, there's a, they're a whole group of dudes. Let and they're me all, on, homie. I can't keep up with this shit. It's I'll impossible. I'll send you links. Uh, it's and impossible. that's why we love doing this show. One because of, there's so much talent. One yeah. of my first sound gigs was actually XMVIX when they were headlining the FGCU Music Club. Like, Sick. the FGCU, mu- mu- FGCU Music Club, while I was at FSW, was one of the main places I learned how to mix. And so, like... Sick. Trying to learn how to do Sick. cable management with XLRs all over the stage with like a nine piece hip hop group with only like four microphones and they're all just like dropping the mics and shit <laughs> everywhere. Awesome. They're picking them back up mm-hmm. and like they just, pass them. Like, it's yeah, crazy. <laughs> good times. Education. Yeah, I was gonna say the only reason why I turned into an engineer is because I was the only one who cared enough to figure it out. Yep. And like I'd get stuck at gigs and anyone would be like, can someone help us, please, yes. God. And then I started realizing that like the promoter would pay me out more because I helped him out at the end of the night. And I was like, oh, wait a second. There's something oh, yeah. cool here. <laughs> and then like my band got our own sound system and shit. And then like other people wanted to throw shows, but they didn't have sound systems. And then we started renting it out. And oh, man, I'm so happy. I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy, dude. Oh my god! So much of my life, like e- even fucking yesterday, like talking about showing up to, at Ollie's to do a con- do a recording session in the back room. Like when I was going to up to pick all my shit up because we were gonna do it at the dude's house. Like walking into the room, fixing all the gear real quick because the open mic had some tech issues, and then leaving back again. Like that's just, just so much of my fucking life. Can you just like describe to me the show a little bit? It's been so long, and I've missed it so much. If you could just like act like I'm a blind person and you're like the audio caption. I'm going to do some asthma for you. Oh my God, please. So. It's been so long since I've been to a musical social gathering. <laughs> I feel like I'm in 28 days later, bro. So you walk into the room and then you go up to anybody because you've got to go ask the owner where the shit that you left because he let you use the room as a recording studio was left. And then he's panicking because all <laughs> right, you know, of the tweets. <laughs> Because all the tweeters are dead and you're having to run this concert <laughs> off on. <laughs> uh, running the concert off of the fucking monitors with one pointed towards the artist and one pointed back. But they're all wearing in mono because you had to bypass the left right in order to get the fucking tweeters to work on the synth. With one SM58 as the uh, overhead mic for the drums. Oh, we didn't even have the drums mic'd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> didn't have, we didn't have the spider guitar amp that ever, all the acoustic guitars are running through mic'd. <laughs> <laughs> we had one shared knockoff SM58 microphone. Pile 58. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go through, and then you, because you were listening to some weird Advent Guard music, some of the act like some, it's a muddy's ringtone because you're trying to put your phone in through this tape scent. Oh, this is making my nipples hard. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually it worked out, and you just kind of have to leave, but then you show back up and you get a drink for free. Nice. <laughs> and then he said then he said if we had enough money we were gonna pay you but I guess we don't maybe better look next time even though he said this two three times in a row Sean's like my dad so he kind of gets away with it also shout oh, out fucking Ollie Southwest Florida save the scene sick <laughs> hell yeah we got all sorts of shirts available that's amazing <laughs> that is uh, awesome so we talked about least favorite gigs as far as like sound work and whatever do you guys have standout 
most awesome shows you've ever run sound for or just like stand out things that kind of like fueled your fire to keep uh, going? I ran the monitors for Bruce Springsteen at the Hyatt one time. What? And I was going to shit myself the whole time. I wasn't allowed within 30 feet of him. There was only four buttons and two faders that I was allowed to push within three decibels, okay? <laughs> there was a big fucking metal fucking thing on the master fader of the fucking, yes. of the master, of, on the fucking board. And that bitch said, no, <laughs> asshole, okay? All right. I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life because, like, all of these people were like, listen, this gig's really cool. You get 400 for half day, 900 for full day. But if you fuck up one time, you'll never work for this company again. And if I look at you looking him in the eyes, you're fucking fired. And I was so fucking terrified. And it was just an acoustic gig. It was just him and two other people with acoustic guitars. And they played for 45 minutes. And, bro, I could feel my inner doo-doo turning into liquid the whole time, bro. Because, like, I wasn't, like, because I could only move everything by a few degrees, you know, and I'm not even controlling the sound that's going out. I'm controlling what they hear. So if I fuck up, they're going to fuck up playing. So, like, it was a lot. And I don't know if I ever want to run the monitors for a big show again. It's just <laughs> such a weird gig to have, dude. Did you nail it? Did it end up, yeah. the pressure worked? <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, I did. I did. I did. And also somebody ended up fucking up one of the monitors anyways, and it wasn't me that got bitched at. So and also there was like twelve of them on the stage, so it doesn't even fucking matter. But yeah, that was really dope. Also, like all the raves I put on were really fucking cool. But that's for just like getting so many people together to do yeah. so many things. Like yeah. I know people who are married and have kids because they like met at our parties back in yeah. the day. What? Like yeah, but I also know of people who have like died in drunk driving accidents on their way home from our parties too. So like there's been a lot of things that made me stop and think like, is this really what I want to do, man? But also like when you are involved in this kind of industry and you are interacting with this many human beings at one time, bad things are going to happen and you have to figure out what to do afterwards, you know, and you can't be blamed for it. You know, you have to let yourself off the hook and you have to realize that these are adults that made these choices, you know, all of us did crazy shit back in the day. It happens, but also you have to be safe and know your limits. And that's mm -hmm. like the biggest lesson we learned because there was definitely times, like I said, where I'm like, oh, maybe I should just work on computers for the rest of my life, you know? <laughs> but like, you take risks, dude. That's why we're all in this, in this industry, you know? It's high risk, high reward, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So like, and that's where like, every day you have that thought of like, oh should I God. just have a nine to five and then go home and play video games and play the guitar just for fun? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I fucking do an eight hour shift fixing TVs for a warranty company. And I realize how fucking lucky I am to do what I do. Like, I like the fact that I can wake up every week and be like, what do I want to do to make money this week? But also it keeps me grounded and knowing that I'm lucky to have the skill set that I have and the ability to work towards getting better at it. You know, what about you, Cody? What, what is your standout awesome sound experience? So stupid fucking answer every gig that i have is one of my best because not just like i'm newer to the industry but still fuck you but like but also like i don't have bad gigs and all my gigs are good not because like i'm fucking good but because like once again i'm doing what i enjoy doing so even like because i didn't get to i didn't get to answer for my bad gig answer um, like my worst gig was having to figure out how to install in your monitors an hour before a concert. Hell yeah, oh. dude. And even though like I had to go up in the sound booth and cry for a bit, like it still fucking worked out. One of my best concerts ever put on. Did you have to like figure out where to like put the sin channels out and oh, how to route yeah, everything? Yeah, routing out of a Behringer X Air. Oh, and, then, and it was like, the air too. You didn't yeah. even have like actual faders and everything. That sucks. And the dude who had who the dude who's that's the iPad was on, one, right? Yeah, yeah. The it's, dude a, it's a mixer with no faders that you just control with an iPad, and nothing is like logically where it should be. So the whole thing is just a fucking nightmare. <laughs> and there's this thing called a matrix where you can control where everything goes in and everything goes out, and it's always at the mercy of who was using it last time before you, because yep. everybody runs their shit through their own channels. So half the difficulty of being a sound guy is figuring out what the fuck this asshole was doing before me, and every sound guy hates the sound guy who was working on the board before them. <laughs> for the same exact fucking reason because you're just like what the fuck were you thinking when in reality in the moment his choices were probably smart and the right thing to do you just hate him because you don't understand it and it's inconvenient for you in the moment it's even worse when that sound guy is yourself it's just like who the <laughs> fuck set this up God, that's what? such a good point and when you're like fuck what fucking you go to load up and figure out what scene it is and it's like you're a fucking scene and you're just like i hate myself this is awesome what am i about to learn how am i holding myself back 
this is me self-sabotaging and yeah. I have to recognize this. And also, like, I suck. And that's, that's still fun for me. Like, I, maybe it's just like some weird, like, spiritual masochism but like i enjoy the shitty gigs just as much as like the great gigs where nothing goes wrong and honestly the gigs where nothing goes wrong it's fucking boring like yeah Yeah. if i'm not having to like break up a fight at a metal show in between like because the owner's wife was about to go beat the fuck out of a 17 year old wow which night of doing i was this (laughs) (laughs) like that that's fun for me. Like, I'm still young enough that I can get away with, oh, hey, this is a fucking adventure. Let's yeah. see where it goes. Like, I'm sure, like, when I'm 40, I'll be like, I don't want to get punched in the hand at a fucking gig. Oh, I got punched in the face by a stranger at the doing shit one time, and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I can't stop talking shit about doing shit. I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, were you at the party where, uh, back when. Colin Orion was in Soapy Tuna. A200. Sorry, A200. Yeah. I snuck into doing shit wearing a borrowed bikini and a sweater at at like 19 into like the bottom floor to go watch A200 play. I was going to say, I worked with him like the entire time that Colin was with them. So I'm pretty sure I was with them when that happened. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> Crazy times there, bro. I've watched people ruin their lives in 10 seconds. At doing shit. It's one of my favorite things shit. to talk about. Yeah, did I not tell you any of those stories the first time I was on here? I don't think so. Holy shit. Can I please just yeah, go off yeah, on this yeah, for a yeah. couple minutes, bro? Who let me wipe my forehead off? Oh, Lordy, Jesus Christ. Okay. Also, like you were talking about before, I'm just ADHD and want to just acknowledge this. You were talking about like learning on the fly and shit. When you're mixing a band and you have a problem that you've never had before and you figure out how to like manage that on the fly and like they sound better afterwards. It's so fucking good. Bro, like. I've came a lot in my life, okay? Like, I've come a lot of times. And, like, I've fucked up and, like, made something better on stage a lot of times behind a mixer, too. And I'm just saying one mountain is almost as tall as the other one. I don't know which one I'm exactly talking about. And that's, like, such a fucking incredible feeling when you're like, holy shit, I had an idea and I did the thing and it fucking worked. Holy shit. I guess I can start with the punching in the face story since it was the first thing I talked about. So I would work with A200... (laughs) <laughs> and I love every person in that band. Every person in that band taught me how to run a band like a business, and I love and respect all of them for it, dude. Chris Whited, John Housley, Colin O'Ryan, Vic Jimenez, Bob Tabarini, all of them are priceless individuals in my life. But holy shit, did we see some shit, all right? Um, all right, so there's like an island. Like, you walk down a breezeway, and there's like an island where all the security guards hang out at. And um, I was just sitting there hanging out, you know? arms up on the island talking to the security guards because even though that place is ratchet as fuck the security guards that worked there and held it down were some of the most real human beings I've ever met in my entire life bro bless up to every motherfucker in there bro because I love them so much dude so um I'm sitting by the island and I'm talking to my bassist because he's talking to me about like a new bass cabinet that he wants to get you know and I'm like yeah dude you should probably get that you know having more stage volume is gonna be sweet and all of that stuff and I think it'll sound cool because you can have one on the other side of the drums and all that and this dude walks up to me on the side and it's just like hey and I was just like what's up man but yeah I think if you add a second bass cab to your rig and all of a sudden a fist just grazes my fist and slides up that way And I take a step back, and before I was even like, what the fuck? There are four fucking security guards beating the fucking (laughs) shit out of this dude on the ground. Just obliterating him. And then he gets taken out by the cops and put in the paddy wagon. And I was just like, did that shit really just happen? That was amazing. That was awesome. And like, it all happened in the 15-minute break we had while we were playing. Uh, I saw a girl pass out in the grease trap one time, and she got arrested for it. Oh, my God, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God, I have so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking out, and um, this girl was uh, passed out in the grease trap because I set up all of our lights for the show, and I walk out back to smoke a cigarette where everyone hangs out at, and everyone's standing behind the big black box. We've all seen the movie Seven, right? Like the, the yep. serial killer movie? You should watch it. All right. Okay. So, in the end of a scene, there's something in a box that shouldn't be in the fucking box. And all he wanted to know was what the fuck was in the box. And then he found out what was in the box, and it wasn't what he wanted to be in the box. All right? Won't spoil it for you, all right? Appreciate it. It was a (laughs) small white girl in a bikini wasted off of her ass who decided to pass out in a grease trap. That's who it was. 
And instead of the police being like, okay, let's lightly pull this girl out of the grease trap, they decide to violently yank her out of it and shake her. And then when she came to, she was very afraid because she was drunk and passed out there for fucking probably a long time, man. She uh, just ran out and flailed and ran away. And instead of the cop running up to her and being like, nope, come here, he screamed, stop running, and shot her in the back with the taser. Jeez. And she just fell and slid like four feet on the concrete. And that cop walked up and yoked her up by the arm and threw her in the back of a cop car as she was screaming and crying. She had road rash all over her titty. It was all fucked up. Holy shit, it was a lot. July 4th, 2014, I'll remember for the rest of my life, I watched someone blow their hand off. But yeah, this dude was sitting on the beach and he threw a firework and it exploded over the water. And at that point, people are like, hey, can you not? <laughs> I have kids. And the guy's like, whatever, bruh. And I was already like, this is going to get retarded really fast. This is going to get really stupid. And then he threw it again and it happened again. And at that point, people were already like, should I like call somebody? Should we're security? Should we like get somebody over here? At that point, people were already like well on their way to like get this guy the fuck out of here. And um, he uh, pretty much goes to throw the third one. And you know when there's like that initial charge when it shoots it up into the air? Held it too long. Went to throw oh, it. No. Kaboom. Oh. Yeah, bro. And then people were losing their fucking minds. Oh. People were hiding their kids. They're like, mommy, why did he do that? Mommy, why does he be out of hell? And people were fucking losing their minds. Oh, and uh, I've never experienced trauma like that. That was a lot. That was wild. And then I watched him get pulled into the ambulance. Everybody had to give statements. He had like this distinct look of, I'm so sorry, I keep touching that. Okay. He has like this distinct look of, I only have one hand for the rest of my life at the end of it. It was a lot. Yeah. But the Did one you war see it? Huh? Did you see what it I like? saw it, yeah. It looked like where there was a hand, there <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> it looked like his hand was being invisible for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, but that's terrifying. It's the worst thing ever. I'm totally using comedy to over, you know, just totally hide my trauma. And uh, there was one worst thing that happened, which was like the worst. All right, no, this is a really, this is a short one. This one's not even funny, actually, but it's real because I think it causes, I think it should raise awareness because there are people that are like this. So I was trying to find somewhere to smoke weed. And it was spring break, and it was really stupid of me for, to do that. So I was already trying to find somewhere to go off and, like, hit my little one-hitter. And I'm sitting there doing this, and all of a sudden I hear people screaming from the little swimming pool that's over there. And I was like, holy shit, what's going on? And I walk up to the swimming pool, and there is an EMT losing their fucking mind trying to, like, resuscitate a two-year-old that was fucking in the bottom of the pool. And they're freaking the fuck out. And this EMT is like, can somebody please tell me where their fucking parents are? Just losing their mind trying to help this kid that they think is dead. And their parents walk up with like two daiquiris in each fucking hand from the fucking bar. Just like, oh my God, that's our baby. And they lost their fucking minds and they both got arrested. DCF came and took their kids away like within the hour. And this was like 1130 at night, dude. This was like ridiculous it was like a lot like they're lucky somebody even walked by the pool when it happened because like it could have easily not and that's what i said it's like not even funny but like dude just like the ratchetness that happens around you people have yeah. to be really so they have to be conscious about themselves and what their actions do because people don't realize like who parties up doing shit the two-year-old are you fucking kidding me be better than that for real sorry for bringing down the mood guys but so awareness guys, is important what's your guys's favorite donut <laughs> Uh, they have cookies and cream donuts at oh, wow. Dunkin' Donuts like once a year, and they get my dick rock hard. I always go with Boston cream. Boston cream is great. I love Boston cream, but it's just like that except it's cookies and cream. Oh. It's like Boston cream with Oreos, bro. It's like it's I always so say hot. cookies and cream flavored like anything always becomes my favorite. It's as simple as that. I'm cursed with being fat, and so much of it is because of cookies and cream. Anything. <laughs> If I could write a reverse love letter to Cookies and Cream, I would. But it would probably just say, I love you, but hate you because you did this to me, but that's okay because I'll probably keep answering the phone when you call me over to hang out. Oh, that's just half my discography. Phone? Yeah. <laughs> why do I keep picking up the phone? I'm going to go let Gohan out real quick, so I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, what do you have? What are you working on, man? Like, what are you doing lately? Like, what are you focusing on? The move that I'm using this to procrastinate on. Sick. Yeah. So, hell like, yeah. <laughs> so, I, re- I respect you so for your bluntness. So, actual fucking like business conversation. Yeah. Um. So I use DistroKid because I release an obscene amount of music. Okay. So iTunes recently changed their ruling on album artwork that if you have any like lettering on it it has to be in big old fucking letters artist name and out and or album name so because of that i just kind of have like three eps that i just immediately uploaded and then they were like ha no so um i'm not. feeling incredibly gracious towards you in this moment because i had no fucking idea that's a thing oh yeah like if you have any like so my big thing was i had this series going on where i was re-recording all of my songs as yeah. a folk song yeah so like i had my first album re rehash yeah and that was just a picture of my fridge yeah. with the words rehash written on it in those yeah. little fucking magnets so the sequel to that was going to be redu uh redux and same exact thing, picture my fridge, little photos. Yeah. And iTunes was like, nope. Even though, like, I literally, like, number one fucking album on iTunes right now doesn't meet that criteria. That's super weird, and I'm going to have to look into that further. I wish I had some kind of, like, advice for you or, like, yeah. thing to tell you, but I didn't even know that was a thing, and now I have to go home and tell my entire company about it. So thank you for that. I appreciate you for this little reality anxiety nugget you're giving me but also this is the business baby and this is what we gotta do (laughs) yeah so like yeah i'm i'm releasing an ep for gwen mcmillan that we recorded at ollie's Mm -hmm. and like we had to redo her album artwork so that's what we're finalizing right now you recorded the whole project at ollie's yeah, we was it just like a live recording that you mixed and no, shit we, afterwards? because Ollie's was down, which is why we either everybody's yeah. currently selling these shirts is because the music scene's still recovering because bars weren't open until oh, yeah. Monday. Oh yeah, um, I was just using this the area. Is there like a mandate that's keeping everything closed right now? The, uh, there was. There oh, okay, was. I yeah. didn't know. Yeah, yeah, you out of towner. <laughs> it feels weird. I'm not you, fucking used you, to you it. You northerner. It's weird. It's like, oh, yeah, dude, my mom thinks anybody north of Alligator Alley is a yep. Yankee. It's a weird pair of shoes to be sitting in. Yeah, so Sean was gracious enough to let me just use the entire, like, stage as a recording studio. So, yeah. like, that's where the, the song I'm recording with Chris was yeah. recorded at. That's where, like, all of Gwen's EP was recorded that's at. That's cool. How's yeah. recording in that room? Oh, dude, like, I I have an affinity for, like, la- I don't like recording dry, dry sounds. I yeah. love, like, I love fucking reverberous rooms yeah. where, like, if you just oh, yeah. fucking snap the If the song calls thing, for it, dude, oh, it's yeah. fucking delicious and if you, can you capture get, that right. You can get rid of it, like, just close mic instead of, like, the, having the one room mic 50 feet out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, personally. But, like... Oh, it's fucking beautiful. Yeah, I love overly wet shit, too, man. Like, like it, it's weird, too, because all the music I'm focusing on is, like... It always sounds better when it's just like crisp and upfront, but just like my weird avant-garde DNA just always yeah. wants to know what everything sounds like soaked and reverb and delay with like bit crushing and chopping and screwing and shit. It's ridiculous. So there's always like my version of the song and the artist version of yep. the song. Yes. So. so what we're referring to isn't a sexual innuendo. So you have how dry <laughs> or wet a signal is. <laughs> is called... <laughs> Wet yeah, ass piano. <laughs> so when you're working in a DAW or in a room, you have what's called reverb, and that is a millisecond delay. So delay would be like an echo, 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 and a re- reverb is just taking that and putting it to the fucking millisecond so that it sounds like you have a giant ass room, mm-hmm. you or you're just actually recording in a giant ass room. Yeah. But like, it's what gives it like that feel and texture of like being so fucking epic, and it's literally a knob of zero percent. Yeah. Wet or 100% wet. Yeah. It's just how mm-hmm. much the effect is affecting whatever sample you put it on and all of that fun shit. Yep. And also, that's a fun knob to automate, too, because you can start something super dry and make it sound like it's at the end of the earth. And I like that <laughs> a lot. Been using a lot of, like, reverb sends yeah. and then automating it to the send and then automating the actual volume of the yeah. reverb separate. See, I really, really like the idea of, like, sins and buses and all of that fun shit because when you're recording a big band and you have that many inputs, it makes sense to do it like that. Mm -hmm. 
But a lot of the shit that I mix doesn't really have multiple instruments like yeah. that. So I find myself running effects loops in different ways than I would yeah. before just because like there's no rules in what we're doing. So like I'm not afraid to break them. And every new fucking successful hip hop or indie artist I hear is just like breaking five different rules at the same time oh, yeah. when I listen to their shit. So at this point, I don't even give a fuck anymore, bro. If it sounds good, I'm going to fucking try it, dude. So I'm like putting Preach. things like out of phase on purpose and then putting a delay on them to make them go back into phase like like a quarter time into it and shit. So it's like bouncing like an old <laughs> Leslie cabinet, but it oh, sounds cool shit. and it's on yeah. hip hop vocals. So like at this point, I don't fucking care if it sounds good. Print that shit. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> So I wanted to ask before we wrap it up here yeah. uh, a quick question. Why do you use DistroKid to distribute? Just well, a, just a uh, because I released five EPs last year, and that if I'd use CD Baby, that'd be sixty dollars a pop, three hundred dollars. I made five. I made twenty dollars, and fifteen of that was through referral fees. Yeah, DistroKid's <laughs> rough. Working with DistroKid is rough. Um, have you ever heard of United Masters? I have. Uh, I've I've checked out all like the. They work just like Lander, right? Yeah. I don't know who Lander is. Lander is a, a platform that allows you to master your program, your your songs automatically, but it also gives you opportunities and options to distribute distribute them afterwards. I th I think it, I think that I think that sounds about right with yeah. United Masters. I don't know too much about it, but I know the guys over at United Masters like work. One, they're easy to work with. I know yeah. everyone has issues with DistroKid and heard good things about United Masters, but they also help push onto like other mm -hmm. platforms like they help get uh shout out just low they help get my friend just low a song yeah. on 2k yeah like nba oh, 2k shit. so yeah like they just help push different routes and avenues well, all right so one of the things that's in gang beef entertainment's business model is uh we show people what the different options for distribution is because independent artists aren't the only people who use things like TuneCore and cd baby all right most big record labels are using this as well you know, like they give them, you know, five grand per quarter and they get a certain amount of releases. But when you use like a, dis a distributor that you pay per release, you pay per release because you're getting, like he said, you're getting the benefits that come with that. But you only get those benefits when you know you're making money off of what you send and what you put out. Mm -hmm. So if you do something like his where, you know, you pay a certain amount per month or, you know, you pay a subscription and you can release as much as you want. That gives you more freedom to not have to worry about putting more money financially into your product. So there's definitely pros and cons to both of them, but it's up to the individual consumer to know that, you know, because mm -hmm. there's lots of people who are like, I got a top 40 song, bro. We just got to get it out there. And it's like, where are your other top 40 songs at then? You know, like, do you know that this is going to make money? Have you made money like this before? I'm not saying this to like be pretentious or be derogatory, but like you need to know which one to use based off of what your projections for your media was mm -hmm. before. And if you don't have those projections, you don't have enough information to know that you should be paying $10 per release because you're not even in the industry enough to really use the, the benefits that you have from doing that. So like part of our job is letting people know the difference between those. And also sometimes we don't even have to put, put them on, on iTunes or Tidal or anything like that. A lot of times we just, you know, we have a package where we just upload your shit to Spotify because it's free to upload to Spotify for independent artists. Mm -hmm. But you still have to be copyrighted. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a weird little, weird little conundrum. We're so having a conversation after this. Yeah, hell yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd I feel be like happy we're gonna to. have like another episode right after this is over. Like we're always gonna talk about this. <laughs> yeah, dude. new podcast on the City of Palms Broadcast Network. I'm okay with that, dude. I, like, I like. I that's one thing that I love doing more than like inspiring artists to be an artist themselves. Is like enabling entrepreneurs to be more of entrepreneurs. You know, yeah. like that's why what most independent artists do. Like when we said at the beginning of this, most people focus on getting so good at their craft they don't focus on working on its packaging and having figuring all of that out. So 
there's nothing more that I like than seeing somebody else empowered by the advice or the direction that I gave them or anyone else for that matter, dude. It doesn't even have to be through me. As long as you're getting fucking from A to Z, dude, then that's really all that matters. You just have to like put the gas in your engines to do it, you know, because a lot of people have all the gas and the rocket power. Their just navigation system sucks and they're trying to figure out what coordinates to put in so they don't crash into a fucking sun somewhere, you know? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bruh. fucking daunting fucking dude <laughs> yeah uh before before we do wrap it up i'll give you both time to like plug everything that you yeah. have going on that you want people to look at but before we wrap it up one question that we've been asking all the all the guests is if you could think of someone who you'd like to see on the show just one name off the top of your head we'll start with you evan who would you like to see on the show uh, my friend Danny James is the most underrated musician in this town, I think. And this motherfucker is sitting on so much material and so much good wisdom about the world around him. I think he could really, really, really inspire some people and have a good conversation with you two here. Because he, uh, his name's Danny James. He used to be in Scientist vs. Werewolf with Colin O'Brien. He was in a, a bunch of other really kick-ass bands. He's in a project called Planitia. He was my guitar player and main songwriter in Tiberius. Oh. But he's about to be coming out with a whole bunch of crazy shit. And every single time I go to his house and he plays me his music, it makes me feel like I am nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Those are sometimes the best people to be around. I you know? fucking love every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Cody? Who would you love to see on the show? We all need to collectively bully Sean Dunnigan into just doing way more promo in general. <laughs> dude, he, when yes, I sent dude. you the list the other day, and it's Sean, S-E-A-N, that was the Sean that I was referring to. I yeah. really want to get him on the show. Yeah, like, when I was on Three Song Stories, first fucking name besides December was Sean. If I have a chance to plug him whenever I can, fucking Sean Dunnigan, because, like, awesome, that dude, yeah. dude has stepped up and been, like, in, like, the th- six months I've known him has been such a goddamn father figure who is... In- so fucking smart and uh, he's gonna feel so fucking like shitty when i talk (laughs) about this he's just so fucking smart he's so fucking like stubborn that he's managed to get his fucking bar through not one shutdown but finally two fucking shutdowns that's wild man and he kind of like embodies local support like supporting local you know what i mean because he's not he's not in this to like have the most popping bar ever he's in this because he loves seeing all of you guys he loves seeing these people and he wants to see everyone move up the same you know what i mean yeah. I, and i posted on the instagram today with like a little ad for the shirts i i, I mentioned how as creatives like as important as it, as it is to harness your craft and like all of us want to do it all ourselves you know like all yeah. of us want to oh, yeah. learn how to like record it mix and master it like produce it it's impossible i'm just gonna spoil it for you right now it's impossible i'm like in a company where i'm expected to do all of this and i'm losing my mind yeah but yeah. we're doing it, but I'm still losing my fucking mind. Mm-hmm. So, like, I feel like one of the best things about being an entrepreneur is, like, knowing when to outsource to. Exactly, dude. yeah. Like, for mm-hmm. sure, dude. Like, I feel like people's pride get in the way of yeah. their success because they feel like they have to learn how to do everything. Yeah, and, and you see businesses fail because the people yeah, can't, dude. they can't properly oh, yeah. outsource. They I can't, love, they micromanage. I love realizing what my weaknesses are just as much as mm-hmm. I love knowing what my strengths are, you know, and also when you have the ability to find and make a good network that makes your job easier through outsourcing, it's cool because like you, you outsource enough, you know the process that they do and eventually you'll learn it, you know, you just Shout have to not... December. Yeah, you just have to <laughs> yeah. not be a stubborn piece of shit and just like accept the fact that there's shit that you don't know. Yeah. Which is super important, dude. Yeah. I love that shit and so much. And even though like we all don't have money, like you may not have money to pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a logo design by a professional graphic designer or pay someone for, yeah. uh, you know, recording uh, uh, recording sessions because it all costs money. If you yeah. want to like get help from people, they do deserve to be paid for oh, it. Yeah, of but course. even just shooting them a message, you know, oh, I think yeah. all of us like we have gotten and are getting and probably will get messages just like asking for help. Like, hey, where did you learn about this and that? Where, I where did you love those so much? Yeah, because like it, it only takes us a second to yeah. think like, and to help someone else, even though I can't be there in the room and be like, yeah. this is how you do this and that. Yeah. It's like I, I at least want to help but push them. Also, the right like way. that human being is finding out something that they love and they're figuring out how to do it. And out of the entire ether that they could have chosen, they chose to type your name in that inbox, you know. So that's very important that mm-hmm. somebody holds you in an esteem high enough to be able to do that. And I know lots of people who are in this business that find it highly annoying that people do that. And they have this pretentious attitude of, ugh, figure it out, stupid. And I fucking yeah. hate that. There's lots yeah. of people that I say that to, but they deserve it when I say it to. But if you're, like, legitimately trying to get better at this, dude, 
I love helping people out, dude, because, like, please help me inspire you, man. Like, fuck, yes. I love that shit more than anything, dude. Yeah. And the last thing I would ever want is to, like, be intimidating to somebody who barely knows who I am when all of us should just love who we are inherently anyways yeah. and not be afraid of one another, you know? Yeah. Because, like, you're... Your accomplishments are transient. They don't mean anything, you know. You're constantly becoming, you know, you're not who you are. You are becoming what you are becoming, you know. Like, it's like a it's like a positive feedback loop that you have to consciously be self-aware about. So mm-hmm. if you can help people on that same journey, it's your fucking responsibility to, you know. Yeah. And as yeah. much, like, I feel like a lot of artists, um, they, they'll have the mindset of, like, they don't want to, like, like get the secret out there. Like if they have some oh, some like way so that they much. like some painting technique oh, that no one else does. Worst. And like it is cool. It is oh, cool to know. I have to commiserate with some about you on some <laughs> with you so bad on something. Please finish real quick, please. No, I was just I was like I feel like a lot of people get in that mindset yeah. of not wanting to reveal because they don't. And I feel like that's just insecurity. Like you, oh, you worry that if you were like it if is. I revealed my stencil technique to someone, someone might do better work than me. It is. But I'm like, yeah. please yeah. do better work than me, please, well, because the, I want to see awesome art. That's you know? the difference between having ego and essence you know ego is fuck you this is mine you can't have it and essence is it's not mine in the first place please take some it's heavy yeah, yeah you know yeah. because and like it's that's important because that attitude of ego is super super self-sabotaging and it's fucking it's absolutely insane and ridiculous and i totally forgot what i was just about to talk to you about and i hate myself for it what were we talking you're about to commiserate about uh, people not wanting to reveal their secrets. Oh my fucking god! I remembered it immediately. Hell yes, <laughs> awesome. I have my flaws. I'm not perfect. Okay, I'm great at being stupid. Okay, I told you this before, dude. You'll all figure it out eventually, dude. So, um, I was recording with this guy when I was 17 with my band, and he wouldn't let us see what his effects chain was. Like every single person, like when they record things, they have certain effects that they put on the vocal. It usually goes EQ, compression, reverb, delay. CLA vocal. Yeah, CLA all day. Waves, waves, baby. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this dude just wouldn't let us in the same room when he was mixing us, dude. And it was like one of the most awkward things I've ever heard in my entire life, dude. It's yeah, it was. And I hear that happening to other people, dude. Like the same thing happened to Danny and Colin when they were recording when they were younger. And I find that happening with a whole lot of engineers. And I hate that attitude of like, fuck you, this is mine. Like, bitch, I barely know what I'm doing. All right. I'll say this right now. Like I am good at what I'm doing because I've learned foundational and arbitrary knowledge that just makes shit sound good when you apply it. After that, dude, it's all preference, dude. Like as long as you know how to like record things at the right volume, learn how to EQ shit and learn how to use a compressor. It's all you after that, bro. Don't waste your money and go to fucking full sale because you're going to shoot yourself. (laughs) All right. You're going to shoot the fuck out of yourself. Are you a victim too, my dude? Oh, dude, I graduated FSW's audio engineering program. Fuck Full Sail. Oh, you fucking gracious <laughs> angel, dude. I know so many people who have been touched inappropriately by Full Sail, dude. <laughs> fuck Full Sail. Fuck and Berkeley. And it sucks, dude, because every single time you meet somebody, they're like, I graduated from Full Sail, and I graduated the fuck out the back door, bro. You have fun figuring out how to wrap up all the next solar cables, dude. You're an A4, bitch. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> So I don't the, know, man. The amount of motherfuckers with no teeth that are gonna be the, that are better at rigging fucking sound systems than some fucking like twenty five year old with a forty thousand dollar per se- per semester degree. I just think as long as you have the urge to get better, then you'll be better. But you can't just like graduate from somewhere prestigious and be like, listen, my dick is inherently bigger than you. All right, not like way bigger than yours, bigger than you, the whole thing. And it's just like, and it's. <laughs> It's exhausting because it's the same diatribe every time when, like, this business doesn't give a fuck where you come from. Just get bitched at less than everybody else and do your fucking job and make it to where I barely noticed you're here and you're going to get paid a lot. And I hate that that's how it is, but that's why I like studio work, you know? Because stage work's just like studio work, except every everybody needs more in their monitor and everything's on fire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My fucking life. So you just have to, I'm like, I'm happy that I've been in the studio so much and I haven't had to worry about lives, live sound, but I, that's a trauma I miss so much and I want it to come back so fucking bad, bro. Before he interrupts, the one thing that I wanted oh, to come no, on the I'm show done, to say, girl, go ahead. What, no, before Brian interrupts, cause he's trying to get this back on the train. Okay. The one thing I wanted to come on the show with, cause like the whole idea of that was pitched to me was audio engineering. 
The only way to fucking do shit is to fucking do it. Oh, Play yeah. music, you gotta fucking do it. Yeah. You wanna write a song, you gotta fucking do it. You yeah. wanna rap, you gotta fucking do it. And it doesn't matter how much you fucking suck. You're gonna suck a lot too. You just gotta lot. fucking do it. And like, you just gotta keep going. You wanna learn audio engineering? Yeah. Holy shit, they have the dude from fucking Foo Fighters breaking down how he recorded Everlong. And he was fucking high the entire time. Yeah. And he got, he's got the bits and pieces there. Yeah. And he will tell you the, his entire fucking effects chain. Yeah. You can listen to Chris fucking Lord Algae explain how to use one of his goddamn fucking plugins. Mm-hmm. You just fucking do it. Yeah, just do it. I suck at like 19,000 things right now. And I'm super proud of all of them. Because these are 19,000 things that I've tried and applied myself to. And if they work, they work. If they don't work, they don't work. But I had fun. I'm not going to compare myself to Thomas Edison and say I learned 200 ways to not make a light bulb because Thomas Edison is a piece of shit. <laughs> okay? Tesla. Yeah, Team Tesla all day. But uh, it's like that same mentality, you know? Be okay with sucking. Sucking yeah. is awesome. I have all- so much fun sucking. I've had so much more fun sucking than being good at shit. I will be totally real with you about that. Being good at shit is fun, but that, mo- that aha moment of holy shit, I just got better at it. Yeah, I was going to say, because all of that led you to where you are yeah. now, and everything you're doing yeah. now is leading you to where you're going to be. Exactly. And I'm, I always try to say, writer, like when it comes to writer's block, I, le- yeah. I, I always try to say, to me at least, I feel like writer's block is just the fear of writing something bad. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, the, the, you're sitting there with a blank page. Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not necessarily because you don't have ideas. It's just yeah. because you don't want to write something and then read yeah. it and go, oh, that's awful. The best you're going to write awful the stuff. The best cure for writer's block is making something that's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I compare yeah. it to, like, throwing a bunch of clay on a table. Yeah. Like, to compare it to sculptures. Yeah. Writing... Anything, songs, books, whatever. It's like throwing clay yeah. on a table. And those songs are always iconic when you make them too. It's I don't know how or why, yeah, but yeah. there's just something about mm-hmm. blasting that, like blasting that process all over. You. Yeah, and obviously to make a sculpture, if you throw all that clay on a the table, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get it to look yeah. awesome and beautiful. But if yeah. you never throw the clay on the table, you're never gonna have yeah, a sculpture. Exactly. I dedicated an entire year of my life to saying "fuck writer's block," but I'm gonna save that for my own episode because mm-hmm. I know we're trying to get this outro tag. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and we'll start with you, Cody. If you had, we've already talked about some stuff that we all do, but uh, just to wrap it up, is there anything you would like to tell the listeners that you have going on that they can look out for that they could click to? Uh, Cody Ampersand Co. Main project. There is Trash Cat Records that has all of its releases coming out soon. Um, Ollie's Pub. Just fucking go there if you don't already. Um, Delete Facebook and Instagram because that's the only way you're going to find my fucking music at this point because I am not doing any goddamn fucking marketing except for like coming and hanging out with vibes. Hell yeah. That's awesome. And what about you, Evan? I mean, we already talked about gang beef. Yeah. Well, of course, there's some gang beef entertainment. You can go ahead and check that out. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of music myself that I'm going to be releasing under my own name. Like, I have a bunch of weird indie projects and shit like that, but I've been making this dubstep music for a few years, and I think it's finally, like, getting to the point where I can release it and feel good about it. Yes. I have a a song that I have coming out pretty soon that I have uh, Nick from Feast of the Antipathy drumming on. Yes! I love his drumming. It's like a a fucking bro step song with deathcore drums, and it's too retarded. And I've never heard anything like it before, so, like, I'm really excited to, like, put it out. Cause like I'm not like trying to specifically do something that hasn't been done before. It just kind of happened, and it sounded way cooler than I thought it would. Like I threw the dart and accidentally hit a bullseye, and I feel pretty cool about it. So there's that. Uh, there's uh, Andrew Glaney. He goes by ACG. He's an artist that I'm recording right now. I have a single of his that I'm recording a uh, a, a music video for in November. So uh, Carlos Gonzalez from Whatever Life is going to be doing that video. So. Yeah. Yeah, he just got all of his camera shit stolen, man. So anybody who knows Mr. Uh, Los Lo should definitely check out his Facebook and uh, help him, man, because he just got like $10,000 worth of gear stolen out of his that car and he crazy. needs some donations to help him out, man. So I'm definitely going to be posting a link for that like every week. But I mean, I'm trying to help him out, too. Um, there's an, uh, an artist called Artisan who's um, going to be releasing a single for before the beginning of the year. So that's going to be cool. Music video coming out for that. And there's another artist called Case in Point that I'm working with, as well as Michael Van Brussel. All of these artists underneath us are just coming out with super dope shit, dude. I could sit here and just name them off all fucking day long. It's fucking ridiculous, dudes. But pretty much just Gang Beef Entertainment, Vine Street Studios. My company is J Perspective Engineering and Consultation. So that's probably something down the line that's more business and corporate oriented. But 
Right now, dude, just Gang Beef Entertainment and Evan Seals. Now, is that all music. on websites or is it just social media we're, stuff? We're on, a, we're on Facebook, social media, all of that. Uh, gangbeef.com is about to be up. We have, you know, I outsourced our web design because I was like wanting to make our website. And then I finally found somebody who made dope shit. And I'm like, your shit looks way cooler than mine. And I want you to make it because I have no problem admitting that. So, uh, yeah, that should be up within the next week, too. I just got to go back and finish a bunch of photo shoots and get everybody's bios and everything ready and all of that shit. So that's pretty much it for me, ma'am. Heck yeah. Thank you both for coming on such yeah. short notice. This Thank has been you really, so much for having really me, guys. Hang. This is awesome. Um, and we'll, I'm sure you'll see both of these guys back oh, numerous yeah. times oh, yeah. over the, the future. Where can they find us at, Danny? Uh, you can find us at City of Palms Podcast. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, we got new podcasts coming every Monday. Follow us, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, that's, you know, we're trying to get to a road to a thousand nice. where I can get a tattoo by this man. Nice. Hey, get away from me for now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stay away. Yeah. I said no gracias. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been episode 66. Thank oh, you yeah, guys dude. for real. Thank yeah. Hit him with that outro soon. Yeah.